Good evening, everyone. I think that those who tell terrible lies have to confess their sins to a bishop. And Bishop Dunn is, is here tonight, so maybe he can make an appointment with Father Doug. <laughs> so I thank Father Doug for his invitation. And uh, I felt a bit nervous about all of this, but I had a dry run at lunchtime and uh, it seemed to go okay. About 30 years ago in the Philippines, I met a man from this diocese, a layman named Danny Gillis. He was working with the Scarborough Foreign Missionaries in Mindanao, in the southern Philippines. And I met him in Cebu when I was in charge of a small Columban formation house. And I invited him over to speak to our students about his experiences as a lay missionary. And I knew he had his bagpipes with him. And I invited him to bring over the pipes and to play them for us, which he did. But unfortunately, I had a visitor who suffered from migraine. <laughs> and this triggered off an attack of migraine. And clearly, Danny had never heard that we Irish gave the bagpipes to the Scots as a joke. <laughs> and the, joke, the Scots haven't seen the joke yet. <laughs> but the theme for this talk that I've chosen is a quotation from Blessed John Henry Newman. I have my mission. I am a link in a chain a bond of connection between persons. And Newman also has a connection with my native city of Dublin because he was invited by the bishops of Ireland to be rector of the proposed Catholic University in Dublin in 1854. But he left after four or five years. The venture never really worked out for a number of different reasons. But he has that strong connection with my city. And in 1954, the Irish government issued a stamp in his honour, in honour of the centennial of his coming to Ireland. And three years later, the Irish government issued stamps in honour of the centennial of the Canadian Confederation because of the close historical ties between our two countries. And I was in Britain, I was in England, in 2010, when Pope Benedict beatified Blessed John Henry Newman. Though I wasn't present, but I was in the Columban House in the Birmingham area. And I'd be quoting from the Pope's homily, because he spoke, he highlighted a number of the highlights of John Henry Newman's th thinking and of his whole way of life as, as a priest. And one quotation that he used is, I have my mission, I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good, I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, if I do but keep his commandments and serve him in my calling. And Father Doug and I, when we were in Rome together, we, we, our group went one day to a place owned by the Passionist congregation, but it's run by a group of lay people. And one of the speakers was speaking about John Henry Newman, and she used this quotation. And the words, I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. Those words hit, touched my heart very deeply, and in fact, I began to cry. Because as a missionary, I've experienced so often being a connection between people in different countries, people of different generations, people of different continents. And even since coming here just a few days ago, my first visit to, to, um, to Cape Breton, I've met many people who know people I know in Scotland. I have been to, I've done supply work on occasion while home the, from the Philippines in places such as Barra and South Uist. 
and in 2013 I spent two months in the Diocese of Argyll and the Isles in Balachulish, which includes Glencoe, and I spent 12 days of that in, in Loch Boysdale. And last Sunday I was in Boysdale for a gathering of people. We had some music and some, some uh, Gaelic being spoken. In fact, uh, I was engaged in conversation with a number of Gaelic speakers. The two languages are, they're different languages now, but we were able to make, to understand each other to some degree. But that is something we have in common. But these words of John Henry Newman, they, 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 they struck me very deeply. And then the words, I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, if I do but keep his commandments and serve him in my calling. Now I am from Ireland and as you know, for centuries there has been conflict in what is now Northern Ireland. And it has its origins in the early 1700s when the Catholic Irish were driven from their lands in Ulster, the whole province, and most of those lands were given to Presbyterians from Scotland. Some were given to Anglicans from England. And that is the origin of the tension and the, con the conflicts from time to time since then, because the descendants of the settlers still have a sense of loyalty to the crown, and most of the Catholics do not. But there was very severe conflict from 90, the early 1970s until the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. But what was not widely known during the years of that conflict was that many Christians, Catholic and Protestant, who were trying to live out their faith were working together to try to bring the, the Christian values into the conflict. One example at one end was the leaders of the churches, the leaders of the Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist churches. They met regularly together to pray and to talk, even though they would have had different political views. And they went to some other countries to give their views on the conflict. But also at the ground level, there were many priests and, and Protestant pastors working together in an ecumenical ministry. And one ministry was specifically to families that had lost members through pure sectarianism. And one friend of mine, Father Jerry Reynolds, he died some years ago, a redemptorist. He was from the Republic, but was in Belfast for many years. And the Redemptorist Monastery is on the line between a largely predominantly Catholic and nationalist area and on the other side a predominantly uh, Protestant and, and Unionist area. And th the Protestant area was just at the back of their monastery. And when Father Jerry went into this ministry, he was working with the Protestant pastor. And their first call as a team was to a family where the husband, a taxi driver, a Protestant, who had been murdered simply because he was a Protestant. And Father Jerry had never been in a Protestant home in Belfast, despite living there for some time. And he was nervous. But when he entered the, ho the home of the widow, she put her arms around him and said, I'm so happy that you came. Now this was going on in many parts of Belfast and other places where there was this ministry by people living out of their faith, living out of their deepest identity. They would have been nationalists and unionists in their politics. They would have been Catholics and Protestants, but their deepest identity was their Christian faith and their baptism. That's what they were living out of. And I have a confrere from Northern Ireland. He's at last behind me. Father P Peter O'Neill. Peter is from County Tyrone and he grew up in a farming area. And he was delivered by a neighbor who was a, a, a midwife and happened to be a Protestant. And Peter's mother did not think he would live and asked the midwife to baptize him. 
So he was baptized by a Protestant midwife. Fast forward many decades, when this Protestant neighbor, the midwife, died, Father Peter was one of those who carried her coffin. Now this kind of thing was going on in Northern Ireland all through that conflict. And I do know that some of the, those involved in the talks that led to the Good Friday Agreement, I do know that at least some of those involved were trying to live out of their Christian faith. People on both sides, they, they, they wanted peace and they wanted to do what was right. And one of those involved was a classmate of mine. We went through school together. He was a senior civil servant in the office of the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister. And he was involved with Northern Ireland talks since the, the early 80s. And I know that my friend Wally, he has a deep faith and he always saw his work as a civil servant as being an expression of his patriotism and indeed an expression of his faith. And this is very much in line with Newman's vision. And these, are, these people were angels of peace. The people who were working towards that. When one, the story about the Irish Prime Minister at the time, Bertie Ahern. Bertie is by no means a perfect saint, but he is a man of faith. And that Holy Week of 1998, when the talks were at a critical point, his mother died suddenly. And he had to deal with his mother's unexpected death in the middle of these crucial talks. And on Holy Thursday, they couldn't find him. On Holy Thursday afternoon, they couldn't find him. And eventually they found he'd gone to the, to the Mass of the Last Supper in some church in the area in Belfast. That's the kind of a person he was, but he was one of those who was crucial to the peace that emerged and has made a big difference in Northern Ireland. But these were people living out Newman's vision. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace. So this is one area where Newman's vision was being lived by politicians. And I want to speak about a particular person who has inspired me and who I see as living out Newman's vision. Newman also said, his mother, and Pope Benedict used this in his homily, Cardinal Newman's motto, cor ad cor loquitur, or heart speaks unto heart, gives us an insight into his understanding of the Christian life as a call to holiness, experienced as the profound desire of the human heart to enter into intimate communion with the heart of God. He reminds us that faithfulness to prayer gradually transforms us into the divine likeness that are, we're called into a deep and intimate relationship with God. And we see that, for example, in the story of Jesus speaking to Peter after the resurrection in the last chapter of St. John's Gospel. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And at this stage, Peter was becoming disturbed, feed my sheep. What Jesus was calling him into, above all, was an intimate relationship with him. And it was in that context of that intimate relationship that Peter went out to do his ministry and to die for the Lord, to die for the faith. And I want to speak about a man who, in whom I see the living out of that gospel incident and the living out of of the, the vision of Blessed John Henry Newman. This man has Canadian connections, though he was from Pakistan. He was a politician named Clement Shabazz Bathi, and he was born in 1968 and was assassinated on the 2nd of March 2011 in Pakistan, outside his mother's home. He just left her home, was getting into his car when he was assassinated. 
and he was the first ever Christian to be appointed to the cabinet in Pakistan and he was given responsibility for minorities that included Christians. Christians form no more than two or three percent of the population and the vast majority would be poor, some of them, some of them very, very poor. But he paid a visit to Canada as a minister in 2009 and he met with the then Minister for Immigration, Jason Kenney, and the two became good friends. And Jason Kenney, uh, no, Jason Kenney met him first in Pakistan in 2009. And Jason Kenney wrote, I immediately realized that he was a remarkable man filled with courage and profound Christian faith. He described for me the plight of all the persecuted minority communities of Pakistan and his efforts as the first non-Muslim Pakistani cabinet minister to defend the afflicted. And Mr. Bhatti visited Ottawa in 2011, early in 2011. And Jason Kenney expressed his fears to the then Prime Minister Stephen Har Harper that, that Shabazz Bhatti would be assassinated, not of course in Canada, but back home. And he tried to persuade Mr. Bhatti to stay in Canada until things had quietened down. And that January of 2011, the governor of Punjab, a Muslim, who was working for the rights of minorities, was assassinated by one of his own bodyguards. So this was the situation at the time. His name was Salman Tassir, Tassir, and he was a Muslim. But Shabazz Bhatti said to Jason Kenney, when he was invited to stay in Canada for the time being, he said, I know the way of the cross, and I am called to follow it. If I do not go back, who will defend the defenseless? Who will be a voice? for the voiceless. Now this is a politician speaking about knowing the way of the cross and knowing the consequences for him, the possible consequences of going back to Pakistan. And Kenny, Mr. Kenny said, we paid a tearful goodbye to one another. I had at the time the sense of a man preparing to embrace martyrdom. And two weeks later, that's exactly what Shabazz Bhatti did. He embraced martyrdom. And it was because of the way he was trying to live the gospel as a politician, working on behalf of the poor and of minorities. And Jason Kenney wrote further, having known and worked with Shabazz remains one of the great honors of my life. I have joined other Catholic legislators in writing to the Holy See to endorse a cause for his beatification. Now that cause was formally begun by his own diocese in, uh, of Islamabad, Rawalpindi, in 2016. And Shabazz Bhatti wrote a testament, and I will read part of it. And for me it reflects, again, the words of Newman. I have my mission. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good, I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, if I do but keep his commandments and serve him in my calling. And this now is, I will quote from parts of the testimony of Shabazz Bhatti. I'm not sure when he wrote it down, it may be not too long before his death. He said, he was, I was born into a Catholic family. My father, a retired teacher, and my mother, a housewife, raised me according to Christian values and the teachings of the Bible, which influenced my childhood. And we see there the connection, the link in the chain. Shabazz Bhatti received his faith and his values from his parents. And then he, he wrote, since I was a child, I was accustomed to going to church and finding profound inspiration in the teachings, the sacrifice, and the crucifixion of Jesus. It was his love 
that led me to offer my service to the church. Now he was only 13 then, but he had this deep sense of vocation. And he wrote, I remember one good Friday when I was just 13. I heard a homily on the sacrifice of Jesus for our redemption and for the salvation of the world. And I thought of responding to his love by giving love to my brothers and sisters, placing myself at the service of Christians, especially of the poor, the needy, and the persecuted who live in this Islamic country. And that reflects Cardinal Newman's motto, Cor et Cor Locutor, Heart Speaks to Heart, gives us an insight into his understanding of the Christian life as a call to holiness. So even at the age of 13, Shabbat Bhatti felt a call to holiness, a call to service, reflecting the love of Jesus shown above all in his sufferings and his crucifixion. He was only 13 when he had that deep sense of vocation. And that vocation was to be a politician and a layman, not to be a priest, but to be a layman. And he wrote, I do not want, when he was asked to take the easier path, just like St. Peter out of concern for Jesus, when Jesus said, I will have to go to Jerusalem and to suffer. Peter says, no, no, Lord, don't, don't go there. And Jesus used very strong language, get behind me, Satan. Peter, with goodwill, was trying to lure Jesus away from the mission that the Father had given him. And Shabbos Bhatti wrote, I do not want popularity. I do not want positions of power. I only want a place at the feet of Jesus. I only want a place at the feet of Jesus. I want my life, my character, my actions to speak of me and say that I am following Jesus Christ. That's what he desired, to be known and seen as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I knew a wonderful Italian priest in Mindanao years ago. He's long since gone to his reward. Father Giuseppe Raviolo. We knew him as Father Joe. He looked like uh, Saint um, John the 23rd. He was rotund and had a very jolly personality, which I experienced one night. We were part of a group of priests giving a retreat to seminarians in a place that wasn't exactly a five-star hotel. And we priests were sharing a small dormitory and we had to use mosquito nets. And I had to get up in the middle of the night and I accidentally wakened up Father Joe. And instead of using words that a priest wouldn't normally be expected to use, he began to chuckle and I could see his stomach going up and down with laughter. But during the Vietnam War, he was rector of the major seminary in Saigon. And at some stage of the war, the North Vietnamese army invaded Saigon. And the soldiers were divided into groups of three, the North Vietnamese soldiers. Now these were soldiers from a communist country, no chaplains, nothing like that. But the standing order was if, if any of the three tried to surrender to the other side, the other two were to shoot him, to kill him. And this particular group of three were surrounded by either Americans or South Vietnamese. And one of them ran forward and surrendered. And the other two did not shoot. And later when the three of them were captured, they asked him, why did you take that risk? But the man who surrendered was a Buddhist. And he said, I knew you were Christians and that you would not shoot me. And it happened the two were Catholics and they had discussed the matter and had agreed that they could not obey this order. They could not murder their companion. Now here was a Buddhist soldier from a country where the church was pretty much suppressed at the time, risking his life because he knew his two companions were Christians. 
and he figured they will not shoot me because they are Christians. And Shabbos Bhatti, I, I want my life, my character, my actions to speak of me and say that I am following Jesus Christ. And that's what all of us are called to. All of us are called to that holiness. That was the vision of, of Cardinal Newman. And that vision was emphasized by the Second Vatican Council, where the Church taught very clearly, all of us, by virtue of our baptism, are called to be involved fully in the mission of the Church. And for lay people, much of that is to be in public life. Not so much in, in ecclesiastical life, but in public life. And that lay people have a particular vocation to be involved in the affairs of state and in public life in general. And Bhatti wrote, I want to live for Christ and it is for him that I want to die. I say that as long as I am alive until the last breath, I will continue to serve Jesus and this poor suffering humanity, the Christians, the needy, the poor. And later in another part of his homily, Pope Benedict refers specifically to Newman's great love for the poor, particularly as a way of living his priesthood. He lived and he lived out that profoundly human vision of priestly ministry in his devoted care for the people of Birmingham during the years that he spent at the oratory he founded, visiting the sick and the poor, comforting the bereaved, caring for those in prison. No wonder that on his death, so many thousands of people lined the local streets as his body was taken to its place of burial, not half a mile from here. And last Monday, the gospel was the gospel of the last judgment. Jesus calling some to be on his right. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And when did we do this, Lord? Well, when one of the least of my brothers was hungry, you fed him. And that was what Cardinal Newman lived. And Pope, Pope Benedict highlighted that aspect of his life because he is known more, I guess, as an intellectual, as a theologian. But he was also a very pastoral priest, though he was not a parish priest, but a very pastoral priest with a great love for the poor. And there is somebody to whom Father Doug and I both have a devotion. He was beatified by Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, a young Italian by the name of Pier Giorgio Frassati. He was born in 1901 and died in 1924. He came from a wealthy family. His father owned La Stampa, which is one of the, the major newspapers in Turin and it is still one of the major newspapers in Italy and would tend to be on the left politically. Now his family were not religious, though he was baptized and he went to mass. But as, even as a youngster, he became aware of the poor around him and tried to help him in his own little way. But when he went to university, he became a member of the Dominican Third Order and he spent long periods of prayer and adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. And he used most of the money he had to help the poor. And he used to visit them in their homes. And sometimes, instead of taking the tram back to his own place, he would give his fare to some poor person and just walk home. But he also loved, as a student, he was just, he wasn't particularly outstanding in terms of his marks. But he was, he loved partying, he loved skiing, he loved mountain climbing and was very, very popular and was a very handsome young man. But that was one side of his life, but he had this deep interior life and a deep love for the poor. And he caught typhoid, I think it was typhoid, probably from visiting a poor family and died within a week or so. Now his parents knew nothing about his involvement with the poor. And just as, as Pope Benedict speaks about the thousands of poor people lining the streets of Birmingham for the funeral of Cardinal Newman, his parents and his family were utterly astonished, the family of Pier Giorgio, 
when they saw thousands of poor people coming to pay their respects and lining the streets the day of his funeral. Now he was living out the vision of Cardinal Newman and I think that Cardinal Newman had a deep impact on the teaching of the Vatican Council about the role of lay people. He was just an ordinary university student but one with an extraordinarily deep spiritual life and especially a life of prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. But this was pretty much unknown to most people and unknown particularly to his family. So Shabbos Bati and, and Pier Giorgio Frassati, they were both living this vision of this vision of Cardinal Newman, which became the vision of the, the wider church. And Bati wrote, I believe that the needy, the poor, the orphans, whatever their religion, must be considered above all as human beings. I think that these persons are part of my, of my body in Christ, that they are persecuted and, and that they are the persecuted and needy part of the body of Christ. So he had this sense of the mystical body of Christ, that we're all connected by our baptism and that the wider people of God were part of the body of Christ and part of his body and he wanted to serve them. And he finished his testimony with these words, if we bring this mission to its conclusion, then we will have won a place at the feet of Jesus. This was so much part of his vision, being at the feet of Jesus, like Mary, like, uh, uh, Mary the, the sister of Saint Martha, being at the feet of Jesus, but not just staying there, but being out among the people of God, serving them. And I will be able to look at him without feeling shame. He wanted at the moment of his death to be able to look Jesus straight in the eye because he had tried so faithfully to follow him. And he, he lived the passion and death of Jesus at the end of his life and during the period before his death. And both of the Shabbos Bati and, and Pierre Giorgio and so many others I could mention exemplified another famous quotation of Cardinal Newman that he was asked, who are the laity? And his own bishop asked that question, who are the laity? And Newman noted, I answered not in these words that the church would look foolish without them. So Newman had this vision, not common in his time, that the church was not just the bishops and the priests and the religious, it was everybody, and that all were called to serve. And Clement Shabbos Bati, for me, is an outstanding example of somebody living his, his vocation. And he, he, was very, he had a very clear sense of a specific vocation to serve the poor, and that, that brought him into politics. And it was as a politician that he followed Jesus and that he died for Jesus and died for the poor. And my hope is that one day the church will recognize him as one of our saints. And indeed, I anticipate the church's decision because I often pray to him and have written from time to time on my blog about him. And in that sense, I feel like a link in the chain, bringing awareness of him to people in my sphere of influence. And there is a British band called Uberfuse, double O-B-E-R-F-U-S-E. -E. And the lead singer, her name is Cherry Anderson. Her mother is from the Philippines. They wrote a song for the first anniversary of the death of Bati. It's on YouTube, and the title of the song is His Blood Cries Out. And this particular band have written a number of songs in which they try to connect their faith with present day realities. They have written some songs for World Youth Days, and they, more recently they wrote a song about Asha Bibi, the Christian woman. She is a Catholic as far as I know who was sentenced to death, having been accused of blasphemy.
falsely accused, and the courts eventually, after many years, cleared her. But then another court, well, maybe we shouldn't fully clear her, but recently the Supreme Court made a definite declaration she is totally innocent. But as far as I know, she has not yet been able to leave Pakistan, though she is being protected. And as far as I know, Canada has offered to take her. I think some of her family are already outside of, of um, Pakistan. And one of my confreres in Pakistan, where a number of my classmates have worked, have, have met a brother of Shabazz Bhatti. So there is that for me, personal connection. It's a kind of a, a, a second-hand connection with Shabazz Bhatti, because one of my own confreres whom I know has met one of his brothers. And this gives me a sense of being linked with one of the great martyrs of our time. And Pope Benedict says of Newman, firmly opposed to any reductive or utilitarian approach, he sought to achieve an educational environment in which intellectual training, moral discipline, and religious commitment would come together. And then he quotes Newman, I want a laity, not arrogant, not rash in speech, not disputatious, but men who know their religion, and he's using men in the inclusive sense, who enter into it, who know just where they stand, who know what they hold and what they do not, who know their creed so well that they can give an account of it, who know so much of history that they can defend it. Now, I have a friend in the Philippines in whom I see that part of Newman's vision being lived out. She is Dr. Frances Edillo. She's not a medical doctor, she is a biologist, and she is chair of the biology department in the University of San Carlos in, in Cebu City. It's a Catholic university. And she has done, among other things, she has done a lot of research in Mali, which is one of the poorest countries in Africa. It's kind of in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, but it's very, very poor. And she's done a lot of research on disease-bearing mosquitoes there. Now, she sees her work as a biologist, as an, academ as an academic person. She sees that that must be connected with the lives of ordinary people. And she sees that as a living out of her faith. And among other things, her, with her, some of her students, she has given seminars, as she says in layman's language, to health workers in poor parts of the city and to help them to help people to protect themselves from, from unnecessary exposure to, to, to diseases. And they have an hour-long weekly program on a Catholic radio station in Cebu, which is a call-in program. And then she is, also, she is connected with the community known as the Community of St. John. It is a religious community of men and women. Some are priests, some are brothers, some are sisters, but she is a lay person who is connected with that community. And it is very much part of her life, of her inner life, her life of prayer. And along the way, I have been a mentor to her in her spiritual life and have a sense of being a link with her and a link between her and her understanding of her life as a professional as a biologist, and how that is linked with the lives of ordinary people. And when the Zika infection broke out in Brazil in 2015, she and her team gave seminars about that in the poorer areas of Cebu City. Now, thankfully, Zika never reached the Philippines, and thanks be to God, it did not spread very far in, in um, Brazil itself. And as she said, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, as my mother often said. So she sees uh, teaching as going beyond inculcating knowledge because she takes her profession as her vocation. Just as Shabazz Bhatti had a sense of vocation as a politician, and Pier Giorgio Frassati had a sense of 
vocation in the sense of being called to serve the poor. I do not know what he planned to become as a professional, though I'm sure I could find out easily enough. He was still at university when he died. But he did have a sense of vocation to serve the poor, coming from his intense relationship with the Lord, especially in the Blessed Sacrament. And I know that Francis, my friend, has a deep spiritual life and a life of prayer that is at the center of everything she does. And she told me that she sees her work in the university as a way of bringing the gospel to, to them, to the students, through teaching different branches of biology, combined with forming her students in virtues associated with these topics in the context of the way the contemporary world influences millennials. So she sees her work as a teacher, as an academic, as a call from God through her life of prayer and as a vocation that demands that her professional and scientific knowledge be at the service of the poor. So there is, a, there is an integrity about her life as a professional. So Pope Benedict quoted, he said, firmly opposed to any reductive or utilitarian approach, he sought to achieve, Newman sought to achieve an, in, an educational environment in which intellectual training, moral discipline, and religious commitment would come together. So I say my friend Francis, as living that out, as a professional, as a, an academician, and living, uh, living her vocation from God to put her professional knowledge at the service of the poor. And just one brief thing, Newman said that the church would look very foolish without lay people. And I have a strong sense of being linked to Korea because the Columbans went to Korea in 1933 and seven of my confreres were killed during the war there and are being proposed along with other martyrs of the 20th century for beatification by the church in Korea. But the church in Korea was introduced by two Korean laymen. They were part of a delegation to Beijing sometime in the late 1700s. And they met, Korea was some kind of a vassal state of China, I think, at the time. There was a strong link between them. And in Beijing, they met some Catholics and became interested in the Catholic faith and became Catholics. They were baptized in Beijing and brought the faith back into Korea around 1785, I think. Now, between the first decade of the 1800s and 1869, there were four violent persecutions of Catholics in Korea, in which thousands of people died, some of them just children. And the last persecution was in 1869. And one of those who died in 1869, he died in jail, was the grandfather of the late Cardinal Stephen Kim of Seoul, who died only a few years ago, and who was revered in Korea. I've been to Korea four times. I never met Cardinal Kim, but I know my confreres revered him. And he had a tremendous love for the poor. And he often took visitors, he would be in disguise, around to the poorer parts of the city, so that people could see the poverty in his city. But his grandfather was died in the last persecution. And a former superior of the Columbans in Korea wrote an article about the Cardinal. And I've checked this with him. I published the article in our magazine in the Philippines. And I checked this fact with him later on. The Cardinal's grandmother was spared because she was pregnant during that final persecution. She was spared because she was pregnant. And the child that she bore was the father of the Cardinal. 
This is a man who died only a few years ago and who was a direct descendant. His grandfather was martyred and his grandmother was spared because she was pregnant. And that son she bore became the Cardinal's father. So Korea is unique, certainly in relatively modern times. It's a country where the faith was introduced by laymen and where even before they had any priests, the faith was passed on and people were baptized. And the first missionaries to go there, they were French. Some of them were martyred. The first Korean to be ordained, uh, Father um, Saint, I have a blank at the moment, but he was newly ordained and almost immediately when he arrived back in Korea, he was, he was martyred. But the, the, the church has grown in Korea and, and a number of Korean presidents, including the current president, have been practicing Catholics with a strong sense of justice. The late President Kim, almost, more than half the people in Korea are named Kim. So it's, uh, you have to be specific. But um, the previous president who had been expelled from Korea and attempts had been made on his life. When he was at university, he studied law, but that's where he became a Catholic. And he took the name Thomas More as his baptismal name. And he had a strong sense of justice, a strong sense of living out his Christian life as a politician. And from what I hear from my confreres in Korea, the current president, whose name I can't remember, has a similar vision, that he is trying to live out his faith as a politician. So this is more examples of people living out the, um, the, the vision of, of, of Cardinal Newman that became the vision of the Church in the Vatican Council. Now I want to end with something more local. It's not specifically, specifically religious, but at one level, but at another level it is. And it's, it's on the theme, I have my mission, I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. Some years ago, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, a Canadian priest in, in the Philippines, Father Dave Warren, gave me a book of short stories by Alistair MacLeod. And I read them all, and just recently, I was reading up about him and discovered he had written one novel, No Great Mischief. And fortunately, I, was able, I found in a bookstore in Dublin, No Great Mischief and all his short stories. And before I came here, I read the novel and I've been reading some of the short stories. But the novel No Great Mischief covers six or seven generations of McDonald's. And the original one is Callum MacDonald. And in the novel, he's buried very near the sea in some part of Nova Scotia, of Cape Breton. And another feature of the novel and some of the short stories is dogs. The family's dog in contemporary times or modern times was a direct descendant of the dog that followed <laughs> the original Callum MacDonald when he was going out to the boat and he had decided to leave the dog behind. But the dog swam out after them and they had took pity on the dog and took the dog here to Cape Breton. And even the very dog, uh, in the, 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 the narrator is, is a Callum MacDonald living in the second part of the last century. So the very dog that the family still had was a descendant of the dog. But there's a, there's a very moving chapter towards the end of the book. The, the, the narrator, Callum MacDonald, his parents were lost. They, they, they were crossing on ice to a small island. They thought the ice was sound, but it wasn't. And they and some of, uh, one of his brothers were drowned. And he was raised by his paternal grandparents. And towards the end of the book, his grandmother, she's already, I think, 106 and living in a nursing home. And he goes to visit her. Uh, she doesn't recognize him. 
but she begins to speak about a person whom she did know, and it was actually her grandson she was talking about, not realizing that this was he. And she asks him if he can sing, if he could sing, and at first he said no. And then he started singing an old song in Gaelic, a, a song from Cape Breton, in which the McDonald's are mentioned in one verse. And his grandmother reaches for his hand. And then some of the other persons living in the nursing care, old people, they come in and they join in the song and they join hands. And then some of the young staff come in and sing more loudly with more volume and join hands with the older people. And it was a very moving expression of the links between the generations and how important it is to know where we come from and where we are going. I was moved to tears when I was reading the book by that particular scene. The chapter more or less retold the whole story just in a, a, few, a few lines. But that beautiful image of the grandmother clasping her grandson's hand, even though she didn't know who he was. But the old Gaelic song, because she was a Gaelic speaker, brought all the people in the home together, including the staff, the young staff. It was a beautiful image of the links between the generations. And that is how we have received the faith, most of us, from the generations before us. And the person who has influenced me most in my life is my late father. He was a carpenter and he was a construction foreman. And the summer before I was ordained, I worked with him on a building site. And I could see what I already knew, that he led by example. My mother once said to me, she never ever heard him swear, neither did I. And on that construction site, not once did I hear him swear. Not once did I hear him raise his voice. And I knew the tremendous respect the workers had for him. And I knew how great a mentor he was to young workers. He sometimes have amusing stories about um, young architects straight out of university. And he would find their lack of experience amusing, but in, in telling this, but in reality, he was well aware that he used to say to me before I do something new or before an important exam, the experience will be good for you. And he knew we only, we have to acquire experience. And so he was very helpful to young workers, whether they were architects or carpenters or whatever. And he used to speak of foremen who were the same to him. So again, the links. And the, one of those foremen, his name was John Grace. Two of his sons became Capuchin friars and died in Zambia. And three of his daughters became sisters, religious sisters in Tarrytown in New York. And one of them, she's the last remaining member of the family, recently contacted me on Facebook. She's into her late 80s now, so we've become friends on Facebook. And again, another sense. But my father used to go to Mass every day of his life, right up to the very day he died. And after Mass, when he was still working, my mother died young, she was only 55. She died suddenly in 1970. My father died suddenly in 1987. But even if there was a coldness between them, and I can truthfully say my mother was quick-tempered, and she was the one who would initiate these, these little wars. <laughs> but every day after Mass, he would come home and bring breakfast to my mother in bed. Every morning, no matter what the feelings were at a particular time, and she would always have his dinner ready in the evening. And I remember one time when she didn't have his dinner ready, she was, I don't know if you use this word here in, in Cape Breton, she was mortified. She was, do you use that word? Yes. yes. She was utterly mortified. It was the only time in, in their married life when she did not have my father's dinner ready. And it was only a little late, and he just laughed. He just laughed, but they were the ways in which they expressed their love, even if the feelings mightn't have been particularly loving at a particular time. <laughs> but the example of my father, he, what, the person you met was 
the genuine John Coyle. Where, whoever he met, wherever he met them, he was the same person. There was no guile about him. And he was deeply respectful of everybody he met. He did have a tendency, if he met somebody who didn't speak English well, an occasional visitor, he would tend to shout at them, <laughs> thinking that the louder I speak, the better chance they have of understanding. But again, he was perhaps the main link in forming my faith, the main link from our ancestors and from God himself in forming my faith. And so I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. And I want to finish with a poem. I think I've gone over time. I want to finish with a poem by the Scottish poet Norman McCaig, who lived from 1910 to 1996. It's a short poem called Country Postman. And the theme is that of Cardinal Newman, not specifically in a faith context, but I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. And McCaig encapsulates this in his very short poem about a country postman in Scotland. Before he was drowned, his drunk body bumping down the shallows of the Ogleburn, he had walked 15 miles every day, bringing celebrations and disasters and what lies between them to McLarens and McGregors and Mackenzies. Now he has no news to bring of celebrations or disasters, although after one short journey, he has reached all the clans of the world. Thank you.